basically this modelling uh, two papers are ready for release, they're ready for publication. Uh, the Doherty Institute modelling team, who we've been funding for some years actually to do modelling as part of our pandemic preparedness. They, they are expert, they work on pandemic influenza and they are publishing some stuff that they did for us early in the course of this outbreak to help us better prepare. So the two papers that they're publishing, one is one where they looked at some very theoretical models of a worst case theoretical scenario to see whether the, we have the right tools to manage our health system capacity within potentially worst case demand situations. The other paper is one we did looking at the risk of people travelling to Australia from other countries uh, based on that early China export uh, data so that we use that to guide us in some of the recommendations we made to government around border measures. So the Doherty Institute will be publishing those highly technical papers later this afternoon and those of you with scientific brains will be able to, to read through them. But it's very important to understand that these models are highly theoretical and they are not uh, actual predictions, as the Prime Minister said. They're not based in any way on Australian data. In fact, they're based on data derived from countries that have had a significantly worse experience than Australia. Can we have the next slide? So, as the Prime Minister said, um, we are uh, flattening the curve, um, and you can see the Australian curve, which is bending, and that is a very positive sign. And you can also see the case numbers and all of the measures that we've put in place to interrupt the transmission of this virus over recent weeks. But complacency is our biggest risk. We cannot be complacent. But this, this is the Australian data. This is the sort of data that we will now take, uh, particularly the community transmission, and we will get feed this. Our modellers have got this data, and they are now doing real predictions on what might happen in different scenarios in different states, as the Prime Minister said. So this is what the real data is. Now we'll go and look at some of the theoretical modelling. Can we have the next slide? So in a, when we started, before we even had many cases in Australia, the modellers looked at what would happen in this highly artificial situation if right across Australia we had diffuse seeding of this virus so that nearly 90% of the population, 23 million people, were infected at the same time. That's an incredibly unlikely scenario that the whole country gets infected at the same time. But that, in microcosm, has been seen in some cities in the world where we've had these huge outbreaks that have overwhelmed the system. But if that happened in Australia, you would see a very, very big peak. And you can see the most important thing we've been looking at in this uh, health system capacity modelling was what is our intensive care unit bed uh, capacity Be and what is their intensive care unit bed demand. We have already planned to triple our intensive care bed capacity and we want to make sure that we have the tools to manage the growth of serious disease with COVID-19 to within that capacity. So in this scenario, which is what we call the unmitigated scenario, this is where you just let the virus spread, you do nothing, uh, and, and, and treat people uh, as they seek medical attention. And as you can see, and as has been seen in some countries, this is a horrendous scenario. It's not real, it doesn't reflect the current state in Australia, but you would see an ICU daily demand for new intensive care beds you know, of 35,000 plus, completely beyond the realm of any country like Australia to create. So, very important message. If you had this highly artificial, very unlikely diffuse outbreak, you couldn't meet demand. Have the next slide, please. So, what we then did, what the modelers then did, and you can see this in the paper when you download it from their website uh, this afternoon, is looked at in this highly artificial, unreal scenario, what do their mathematical models tell you about the tools that we have and that we have already used to mitigate an outbreak? So what they've shown firstly in, this, in the second blip is what happens when you do what we have been doing in every state and territories is quarantine and isolation. Detect a case, 
isolate them either in the home, in a hospital, make sure they don't spread and quarantine all contacts. That has a huge reduction in the spread of the virus, which I will show later on. But it still shows that if, you, if that's all you do, and you have this huge artificial countrywide outbreak, which again is unlikely, but we have to model for the worst case scenario, you would still materially exceed ICU daily bed demand. So then what the modelers have done has looked at a range of uh, what social distancing measures. Because we know that the social distancing measures reduce the transmissibility of the virus. We, we've already seen that. In fact, the modelers are already looking at early data on what's happened with social distancing in Australia. And you can see that you very significantly drop the peak. Obviously, you extend this theoretical outbreak, and I make it very clear, this is not any way a prediction of what might happen in Australia or the length of an outbreak. It's just showing what would happen in this highly theoretical Australia-wide outbreak and how effective these measures are. That's the purpose of this graph is to show that the measures that we have put in place successively, quarantine and isolation, and then social distancing, which we can dial up and down, have a major downward effect. So that if you do have an outbreak that is not properly controlled, you can apply these measures and we know we'll get control. Next slide, please. So just a couple of scenar some scenarios that you'll see in the paper when you read it, um, that in the unmitigated scenario, you would only get uh, about 15% of people who, could, who need ICU beds could access it in a conservatively increased ICU bed capacity situation. With quarantine and isolation, you get a much lower infection rate, um, lower hospitalisation rate, but still most people who need ICU don't get it. Once you start to introduce social distancing and with a little bit and then more, you can see that we very significantly reduce the infection rate, we very significantly reduce the hospitalisation rate and we, we know that we could meet the ICU bed capacity. So again, we know that in theory we have the tools that we can dial up to, to suppress an outbreak, to manage it within our resources. This is not, again, not predicting what we are doing now or what's happening now. In fact, the measures we put in place now have already reduced our infectivity rate much lower than the model impact of even this most significant implementation. So it's not a prediction, it's just showing that these tools work. Next slide. So what, this is what the modelling has been. This theoretical modelling, this is what's published and you can pour all over that when it's released on the website. Um, but our future modelling is probably what we're more you're more interested in and this is going to be based on real world Australian data. So in the real world in Australia we don't have a diffuse outbreak across the whole country. We have focal outbreaks. The one that worries us most of all is the community transmission in Sydney. I've been saying that for a while. That's the one we're focusing on. That's why New South Wales Health has been so proactive and forward-leaning in doing a range of broadened testing in a whole lot of suburbs where they're concerned. And the early indications, as we've said, are positive, but we cannot be complacent. We must not be complacent. We must hold our line. Our current case rate is, in, is very, very low. Every death is a tragedy, but our death rate is one of the lowest in the world so far. We don't know what it'll be as disease progresses, but we are uh, reassured to some extent about that. It's a tragedy that everyone, every one of those deaths has occurred. The community transmission is what we're going to focus our modelling on, working out what the infectivity rate, what the, what's, what's likely to happen, where, the, where those transmission events are occurring. We have to also factor into our modelling other things, like we're still seeing cases in return travellers. Our quarantine measures have been effective, but we're seeing positives in people in the quarantine hotels. We have to be sure we've got enough tests to be able to test broadly, and we have to have public health mechanisms to, to make sure we can quarantine and isolate cases. And we're now starting to see in the modelling data the true impact of 
the wonderful uptake by the Australian community of social distancing and general hygiene measures. Some of those measures I think will stay with us all forever, even when this is over. I think the new approach to hand hygiene, personal hygiene has probably changed the way a lot of us think, and that's fantastic. But we're seeing the impact of these measures in the disease now, and we will start to be able to produce and share with the public the models of, of what future potential scenarios in Australia are. As the Prime Minister said, we are, we're not out of, in any way out of trouble at the moment, but we are in a relatively strong position to keep the pressure on, make sure we're well prepared and plan our next approach in dealing with this virus. But the most important message from this model is we know that the tools we are using are, do work and we can scale them up and down as necessary, and the data we have so far suggests that they are working. 